We are recording. Hello, world. Welcome back. <laughs> I'm Christina, for anyone that doesn't know me, and I have the lovely Deb Bronzini with us today. It's actually Brozina. Brozina. That's, that's yeah. the way to pronounce it. It's a Slovak name, actually. I'm half mm-hmm. Estonian, half Slovak, so everybody thinks I'm Italian. and I'm like, I'm oh. fine. I'll eat that. <laughs> that's funny. My family's very Italian, so in my head, I was like, of course it's... <laughs> of course. Yeah. And usually I get the fish, and I, to the point where I'm like, why didn't I just change my name to the fish? But, you know, friends, you know, that's usually what I get. I'm like, yeah, cool. Works for me. I answer to anything. Just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> well, Deb, I was wondering if you could tell all the folks at home watching or listening around, <laughs> um, <laughs> what was your first job in the film biz? Or how you first started oh, working with so- cameras? Depends on how far you roll it back, but I was uh, I was in business school, and a friend of mine asked me to take a class for fun, and I fell in love with film in the class, and I started TAing for that professor, and I knew I wanted to go in the film business, and um, so I TAed for him all through business school. I was going part time. I I have. Um, workaholism. Hi, I'm Deb. I'm a workaholic. Um, and uh, I was doing the TA job on top of being a part-time student and working full-time. So um, that tells you, you know, motivation level. Um, so I was working for him and, you know, all the directors who were passing through, it was a film review class. And I heard like, no, just tell everybody, you know, you want to get into this gig. And I did, and my first job was as a PA, um, because a college, a guy I know who's on the board of the radio station I worked on in college, his nursery school best friend was an executive producer at a commercial house. Watch that bouncing ball go by. And she recommended me to the director and I went on for a day to really just be a PA and do nothing but manage the lunches and the coffees and which I apparently did well and they invited me back um and I eventually became an office PA and realized I and and started up the route of production coordinating and realized that was too close to what my old job was and I didn't like that I was happiest next to camera and I knew only the best were union. So I, I happened to be on a non-union job with a union camera assistant who let me, and, and the producers now had hired me repeatedly. They said, okay, you can load on this job after you, you know, get everything coordinated up until the day of. And that's how I got into camera. And my first day loading was 22 hours on an Airy 3. My thumb was shredded at the end of it from that knurled piece on the bottom. 22 hours. Yeah. I, I have to say that those are my favorite memories, but it's so funny that you look at it now, like we're quarantining or like, remember that time when we worked for 24 hours? <laughs> like we like look at these days. Like, yeah, I know. It's been three months. I haven't seen a set. Remember that wonderful 22 hour gig even well, me you know it's so funny i was helping my uncle with a ratchet strap in his like garage and i was like oh remember ratchet straps like <laughs> all the, the carts that we have to like lock in every night and every morning and i was like that yeah. this is getting bleak you start missing ratchet <laughs> when you look fondly at a ratchet strap yeah it's like oh i know how to untangle I that a little bitty bag into my knitting bag not good. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are now. <laughs> get a battery in it on a good day. Um. <laughs> well, can you, um, do you mind explaining a bit more about your process into operating? Sure. So um, I've always been happiest with my eye to the eyepiece. I, I, knew, um, I knew I didn't really want a DP. I mean, I can. It's not like I can't. Um, but that job was just like, I ultimately want to direct. I know that. So to me, that's the, that's the job that you walk into with no definable path. What's the path to that? How do you grow up? There are other ways of growing up on set and all of them give you ways of thinking of, of the project. And I was happiest in camera. I was just always happiest. And I 
probably waited about five years too long to make the transition. Um, because there, there wasn't an obvious transition to it. I was seconding, I had, I was doing some firsting and I knew when I made that choice that I was at a stage of my life and my career that if I went into firsting seriously with the investment in equipment and gear that that takes, that I was not going to get to operating. I was not going to be able to, to get that done. So uh, I started looking to see how I could go about making that leap. And finally, I just said, okay, I'm just going to declare it. I'm just, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to do it and trust that it's going to work. I didn't have all of my 40 days because I was a day player. So there wasn't that obvious moving up on a job that's possible now in television in New York. Yeah. Um, but I had done all of the, you know, practice on the wheels, do all of that stuff. And I went into the office to change my card the day before the Weinstein scandal break. It was my birthday present to myself. And I went in, took care of the paperwork, and the next day out came Jody Decanter's article. So it was, I I think we have better structures for helping people through that now. Um, It's just kind of where I am in the pack of women coming up. It's like just earlier in that process. I'm very glad I did it. I'm, I just regret not having done it about five years earlier because I started not being that great of an assistant. You know, it's just, I was always a really good assistant. And then I just kind of, it just, mm. you know, that anxiety you get when you do something wrong, you'll never work again. I stopped having that anxiety. Oh. <laughs> it's not like it's a healthy anxiety, but it really does help you be as good at your craft as you can possibly be. Mm. Yeah. I kind of, oh, oopsie. All right. Oops. Not, not, not where I want to be. Not where I want to be. Well, I have to say that's, that's been really exciting about the series for me. And I I think, I hope for people that uh, are watching this too, is that the combination of the camera systems and the operators, it's the, and DITs, it's, it's all of us that help with the DP's vision. And I think especially it's exciting to see you know, on set more so than when you just watch a movie because you really feel how it's being made and that sense of how much operators are in it. You know, like there's one thing for people to say, this is what I want. And it's another person to be like in that arm to make that happen. So it's, It's, yeah. It's a completely different job. And everybody told me that there's that in your bones understanding of how completely different is that Mm -hmm. now uh, October will be three years since I changed the card. I'm just doing the math in my head. Yeah, three Congrats. years since I changed the card. And, um, you know, there's, there are all these little mental shifts that happen along the way. Um, but there is this incredible, you just, you, I just disappear. I go into the lens and I'm watching these actors perform and I get to see the movie a nanosecond before, or the TV show, whatever it is, I get to see that a nanosecond before everybody else does. And it's just me and that person. The intimacy of that is what I love. And it's what I had started to really miss Mm. of being an assistant. I'd sort of um, gotten lost in a lot of the mechanics of it, the rush of it. I wasn't able to pause and really enjoy what was going on so magically in front of me. Um, and there are so many times when earlier in my career, when I was like really, you know, at the beginning of it and it was just magic, magic. Um, so the magic's back for me. And, and to be able to say, if I move this, you know, a little bit there, what am I saying? If I move it this way, what am I saying? The intentionality of that, I really love. Can you talk more about your collaboration with DPs and directors and helping those moments? Cause I know that's something at least it's exciting to think about as someone who would like to be an operator one day, those yeah. moments between someone saying, Hey, I, I want this frame versus like that intuition to be like, Oh, I think they really want this frame. Right. So one of the challenges that I found is uh, no news is good news. So okay. there's, you know, in, especially I think in television, there's, um, well, I'm going to give you two examples. There's a standard television format and, Basically, they've got a deadline, they've got a hit, and they've got a, the pressure those guys are under is enormous. Yeah. Um, so 
on TV where there's an established series, my goal is to, as a day player especially, walk in and be able to match their style initially so that it's, they start to trust me. And by the end of the day, then I can start to go, I tend to like a slightly, like here is where I like to be in a frame as opposed to here. Okay. So you see the difference there? Yeah. So um, I tend to want to push it a little bit and let the environment say something about that frame as well, even on a close up, which I won't do because these lenses are horrible. Um, <laughs> um, so on, a, on other shows, so I've done a lot of live uh, event work. So there was a Romeo Santos, who's this enormous Latin artist, uh, did a gig out at um, Giant Stadium. And I get the camera where I'm untethered. In other words, I have no video tap on me. The director's not gonna see what I'm getting. I am supposed to go get specific shots um, and they'll look at it when we're all done. Three hours, four hours, handheld on, on, you know, not taking it off, in the crowd, specific shots, and they have no idea whether or not I've got them. And I love that. That's really liberating. I will give them what they want, and then some. And the same thing happened on Pose, which, um, that was a very different experience. And that's where I really had a good time, and they ended up using a lot of my footage, where you know, Jenny Livingston, who was a director I absolutely admire, she did Paris is Burning. I knew from that movie, which I watched the night before, um, I, to refresh it, I had seen it, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Um, I was like, okay, what does she like for her frames? What is, you know, where's this oh. going? What is she trying to do? And then they, I, they needed um, a documentary camera person in frame. So I had to, and, and they wanted to use the footage and they did. Uh, there's large sequences of that particular sequence. And you were the documentarian? I was the documentarian. Oh, cool. I was playing Jenny. So A, it was the first time in my hair, make, hair makeup and wardrobe trailer. This place is magical. Um, <laughs> I had never been in one. Um, and uh, I love that freedom of being able to surprise a director with something wonderful that for me is fun um so those kinds of so there's two different scenarios that as an operator i walk in and collaborate with and then it also depends on is it the dp who's driving the bus or the director um what's new for me in this role is the amount of uh, coordination we have with the director hmm. in a lot of cases not all uh, depends on the nature of the director too oh interesting are they was it, do you think it's um, not a generational thing, but do you think it's just like a shift in style over time that it was something that technicians would only refer to the DP or? Um, it, I think it depends on the nature of the director's focus. So you know how I said it's the chair that there's no defined path for? So yeah, therefore yeah. it's like which path did that director take and how visually specific they are are they leaning on the dp for the visual narrative and focusing on the actors um are they accustomed to framing with an operator especially if they've worked in europe like that's that whole system's different for them how we do it um and is the dp more of a lighting person or a framing person so if they come up as a gaffer they may not be as opinionated in the framing as they are with something else. So it's, it's all of those and all of them, there's no right or wrong. It's just which path and for this project, what's working. Totally. That's interesting to think about. Uh, would you say that, or can you speak to more of your experience when you have more time to prepare for a project, like maybe on a feature or commercial and they're like, Hey, we know you're going to be on this. This is something to think about before we even step to set. Um, yeah. So, um, if I know I'm going to be on it, which I, that's the other thing that's different from assisting, my calls come much sooner. Like I'll know days and weeks in advance when I'm booked, which is a godsend for just lifestyle and also for prep for exactly this reason. Um, if there is work by the DP or the director, I will often review it. Um, I like to make sure I have access to every cable outlet, every everything that I can quickly put my fingers on material. 
so I can review it. I don't necessarily go through a whole show. Um, and it also depends on how many seasons and what's going on with the characters. Because there's, if you break it down, there's the actual storyline, which is the most important thing. If it's an existing storyline I'm stepping into, I really need to understand where they are mm. and where those characters are and where their visual style has evolved to. New York's become a TV town. I haven't had the opportunity to operate on a feature. I'm, you know, someday maybe it would be lovely. Um, Cause if it is a feature, then it's, I really need to see the script. Yeah. And that's the single biggest problem that I have right now is because they lock down the scripts and everything else. I don't get a chance to really get into those soon enough because I would want to know in my head, I would almost want to know that dialogue for the stuff that I'm working on the next day. Cause then it becomes music to me and I'm pacing to that music. And I just become one of the musicians in the orchestra. Did that answer the question? Definitely. I also okay. really love the musical reference there. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I strong, I come from a musical background and my first movie was the director was a musician, played regularly, that, and his operator and Dolly Grip hat were of the same era, so they had the same musical references. And we would do these incredibly complicated cut and camera 10 minute takes. And not a steady cam, mind you, on a dolly on a dance floor. Wow. Right. So uh, I was the camera trainee, the loader on it. And I learned how they use music to time the shot. So they would both, all three of them would start singing in their heads the song at the start of the shot and they'd be on the same note at the end of the shot all three of them the dolly grip the operator and the director that is so cool <laughs> yeah yeah and it made me realize a musical genre matters that was what happened to connect them they had the same one but you need a variety of it because what happens with the scene yeah. and it is so helpful because in a couple of places the actors had to hit their marks and nobody wanted to make an actor do that but i think at one point they told the actors this is what we're this is what we're saying today okay and i don't know how the actor does that still spit the lines out and act but it was in the back of their brain that's so cool but yeah some yeah. people just got the, actor, the brain for that i don't I don't, like, you've just put the music in my head. That's fine. Everything else is gone. Did I mention I'm like, Dory? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I'm curious because uh, now that I've done the series a bit, uh, I've been, ex like, very curious about how people are in, I hate this phrase, but in their normal life pre-COVID, you know, how they stayed sane right. versus how we're staying sane now. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about uh, maybe how much you even watch movies or television when you're working versus maybe how much movies or television you're watching now? Um, so when I'm working, as you know, the hours are hideous. The only thing I care about is getting sleep and properly fed. Um, that's, that's pretty much, it's, it, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, things really step down really quickly. <laughs> Am I warm enough or cold or cool enough? Am I sleeping? Am I fed? Have I gotten a glass of water in the last 24 hours? Yeah. Um, so I don't, I do find there is this hour before I go to bed, um, preferably not too late, that I do want to just be passively consuming something. Mm. So even when I'm working, it might be, well, you know, it also depends on the state of our world. I might flip the TV on for a half an hour. But I usually, you know, barely, barely. Yeah. Um, and on the weekends, then, I do really want something. I want to be put in a story that isn't the story I'm working on. I don't tend to watch as much by a long shot, unless I'm in prep or rap. Um, and now, um, now it's... I, I was laughing at myself last night. I was on the, I, yesterday happened to be a very long phone day with a bunch of people. And, you know, what are we doing about X? Blah, blah, blah. You know, we all invented these projects for ourselves. 
And I was on the phone with a friend of mine who I was supposed to have been leaving for Amsterdam with this weekend. Oh. And uh, we're obviously not going anywhere. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Uh, and uh, I'm like, you know, I really want to dive into Disclosure on Netflix and I want to dive into these other new ones. And I'm like, but I can't handle anything new. Mm. I'm going to watch the fourth season of The Last Kingdom again. You know, it's like, <laughs> or... I, I'm likely to tackle either all of South Park or all of Golden Girls at some point soon. Mm. Oh, Golden Girls is a classic. It's a classic. It's a classic. And there was a tweet that went by that reminded me of it. Of like, well, Golden Girl, Girls ran for seven seasons and the Confederacy ran for five. Why don't we have statues of Blanche everywhere? And I was like, I have to watch Golden Girls. Perfect. Um, so right now, because of COVID, there's, uh, you know, I, I want long movies. I want, I want, like, I really want to go watch Miyaki for, you know, all of that studio. Um, I can never pronounce the last G-I-L, whatever. Okay. I can never pronounce it. Um, I want to do, like, those just get enveloped by it um, and disappear. I can't watch anything that's modern day. That I'm having Oh, really? Time. I can't be in this moment. I want to be in the past in some gorgeous costume drama or deep in the future on another world where the rules are different. Um, I present day stuff is very hard for me to do. Excuse me. I have a kitty who's demanding attention. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. A British costume drama has saved the day more than once. Um, I just redid. Oh, it does. I hate how it's so, like I'm, I'm a sucker for drama pieces like that. I don't know what it is about. I think, really think that maybe it's a good way of putting it, that real sense of you're in another world, another story, you know? Yeah. With, with, you know, with relatively few real world consequences anymore. <laughs> yeah. Like, Downton Abbey's great. You know, it's just, it's dresses and, you know, tea. I'm good with that. They like sprinkle like a little bit of like social justice stuff, but not too much to make not it too much. <laughs> I'm in the middle. I just spent all day trying to support that. So let me, you know, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, Would you say there are, um, I mean, beyond certain stories or worlds that you go to, are there certain cinematographers that you can always kind of go back to and be like, oh, I, I love their style or yeah. the works that they happen to be a part of. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously the Prince of Darkness, anything Gordon Willis shot is, oh, like I watched all the President's Men, this is why I can't really go back to, it's, that's far enough in the past, but, and I've watched it enough and know the material really well that I could watch it for other reasons. Um, but, you know, the scenes in that newsroom still blow me away mm. and how they were framed. And that fact that they duplicated the entire newsroom. Um, and just there's there's one tracking shot that I still am in awe of in that. Um, there's um, I can't remember who the, this is shocking. Uh, Amadeus is a movie that I will go to. That's a classic. All of the time. And Ray I grew Ray, up with that. Oddly enough, my family like made me watch that really young, and it's like really oh, stuck with me. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, to me, that movie is one of the most visually and auditorially gorgeous films ever made. Yeah. And the, the, I mean, I, I just, I can go into that movie day or night. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely admire Robert Elswit's work. Um, and I've been meaning to go back to um, Ellen Curtis's uh, Spotless Mind. I really mm -hmm. want to go back to that to look at that because of how time travel was, how memory was captured. Um, if you ever get the opportunity to see the um, documentary that she did that was nominated for an Oscar, she did it as director. It was about Laos and- Oh yeah, I haven't seen it. I should definitely see it. She's oh my God, the most gorgeous, gorgeous, just gorgeous yeah. and absolutely perfectly captures the contrast of what was going on in the story to what the image was um, and, and playing on that. Absolutely beautiful. Um, 
I'm just looking to see if I wrote anything else down. Um, yeah, I think no, those, those are know, big ones. You know how the local 600 has offered screenings in the past at what is it that Tribeca um, screening? Yeah, at the film center on Saturday mornings, the education. Yeah, there was one that they, I think, it wasn't, I don't think it was Eternal Sunshine. It might have been Eternal Sunshine. I think it was like an anniversary screening, and Ellen was there, and some of her camera team was there. I think there was an AD that was there. That was one of those, like, that was one of the first times that I went to a panel that was so exciting. Like, it wasn't just like a, a Q&A of the director. It was really that behind the scenes and that feeling of how much they relied on each other. They appreciated each other. You know, those feelings of when you do a tier or independent production yes. and it's so crafty or experimental, you know, and then like, you're like, oh, I survived that. But then years later, it becomes this like classic film. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was girl fight for me. Oh, um, yeah? Yeah. So I came in as a day player on girl fight and it was like 110 degrees and I'm not joking in the, oh. in the area. It was, it was really tough and it was Patrick Katie and obviously Karen Kusama. Um, and those two were so well prepared. And this was a tear job. They were doing a setup every 30 minutes and you didn't feel rushed. Wow. Like you just knew we're going to do this. We're going to do X number of takes and we're going to move on. And it was, they had their list and it, you just had this incredible, you were enveloped by a sense of people who knew what they were doing and what they wanted to achieve. So we were given such clear direction. It, our jobs were so much easier, even in the middle of this hideous heat and tight situation and tight quarters. And, you know, the storyline was tough with an actor who at that time was new. So um, it taught me so much about pre-production and how the departments can work together. And then that women's meeting, I don't know if you were at that one where we had the, we, quote unquote, brought the call sheets and never actually used the call sheets to go through, well, ask me anything. And we, we had all of these very basic questions that were like, but so what does your department do? And how is it split up? And like, so what do you need from us? And how can we help you? And I'll never forget that meeting. And we need to do another one of those because it was like, all of a sudden we're like, yeah, but if you do that, then I can do this. And suddenly, mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Was that one of the like inner guild meetings that we yeah. had represented from 52? And yep. I always forget the numbers for hair, makeup, and wardrobe, but we had representatives really from a it lot was of them. 98, I think, is hair, makeup, and wardrobe. Yeah. I mean, that's I honestly, those, those are the connections that I, I miss because, you know, especially in the, the world of loading and camera utility and assisting the more I work with other departments, the easier job mine is. You know, when I talk to all the Grip Electric guys and ask them about their staging, when I talk to the vanities, like world, and I'm like, I'm sorry, this monitor's so small. <laughs> Maybe right. you can use this one because the producers aren't really watching it. Like all those connections, like those make the job more fun, but also not just fun, but efficient. You know, yes. when you, and then you like know their names and you can ask them questions or you can ask for favors or do favors, vice versa. Really. Yeah, no, it's, and, and. It makes that more I, like a human place, a <laughs> place full of humans. I, I have really deeply come to appreciate hair, makeup, and wardrobe in the land of Zoom. <laughs> it's like, can somebody do this before I get on camera? I'm not used to looking at myself. Like, no, there's a reason I'm behind the camera, people. Um, <laughs> what, you want makeup on me? You know, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think the other thing is, especially for me, I've always appreciated having, you know, people with 30, 40, you know, in some cases, 50 years of experience ahead of me. Because it's a direct connection to cinematic legacy. You know, yeah. so the first... Hair, I think, it was, I think it was hair, yeah. The person I worked with was like a year out from retirement. And I mean, she was like barely still moving around. She was ancient. Um, but her knowledge was so incredible. She could yeah. duplicate anything. And she had actually worked on Marilyn Monroe. So here I am, this baby camp person, 
having this connection across cinematic history. The person who, who swore me into the union was Henry Jaworski. Henry Jaworski was Lenny Riefenstahl's camera assistant. Wow. So, you know, stop and place that in history. Wow. I have, I'm pointing towards a closet where they are in. I have the Nazi transport papers my grandmother acquired to get my, my family out of Estonia. So that, just that link right there was so, that's kind of what we have access to. We get to see people in places that we would, most mortals don't get to see. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> it is really cool. I mean, I, again, I was really thinking the first time it really hit me in that sense of scope was when I worked on Ray Donovan, some of the camera team was from LA uh, mm -hmm. and they had their own blend of unique cinema experience. And one of the camera assistants worked on Jarhead, you know, and some other productions, you know, and it's just, it's, it's one thing to have someone tell you like, this is how I clean. But no, when I was in the desert shooting this movie, <laughs> this is why we cleaned it like this. You know, like I'm not right. saying clean right. the sticks to clean the sticks. I'm saying sand can really, like whether it's Long Island sand or Afghanistan sand, you still need to clean your equipment. And it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> and sand, sucks. sand and camera equipment don't get along. Yeah. But so. it, it definitely made me think too in this, the sense of where we are now in the world, that experience is still really relevant, you know, and when it comes to maintaining product integrity and also your like value as a, a person on set like why you should have a job still <laughs> you know right. it's like all these years like there's so many people that have the experience to share these moments it's not like we're reinventing how to clean right. there's people that have right. been cleaning whether they're in the desert or the jungle with the right. same gear you know right and and our our reality is we need more space amongst us and we're going to need more people you know, it's going to be, it's going to slow down a lot. I don't know that that's a bad thing for our process. I think it's going to make us stop and consider some stuff. Um, Hopefully. Well, a movie is made in pre-production. Yeah. So um, right now, I, I think producers will very quickly find out that if the writers produce 60 pages and you need 42 minutes, for a broadcast piece or yes you can have 60 minutes you can't have 61 because you're doing it for a cable outlet or a streamer it's 60 pages people don't write a page more because we can't afford to shoot it yeah so the, you know the discipline starts there and you know what happens when we start to apply those constraints where creativity comes in and i I think we, you know, when we're old and wizened and like bent over and like back in the day, um, people will ask us, how did we get through this? You know, so I, we'll have stories to tell. We just don't know what those stories are yet because we're not telling them yet. Well, for anyone that hasn't been to the NEB meetings or the local 600 meetings or the women's committee meetings, are there any big highlights you'd like to share or maybe even just sentiments that give you hope through all this? Um, yeah, so the SOC, I think, has done a wonderful job of running their Wednesday inspiration sessions on Zoom, where they're bringing in operators, to your point, like, oh my God, they've worked on these movies that are just, you know, emblazoned on my brain. And to walk through how they created them, and in some cases have their dolly grips on the call as well, and, um, how did we get through this? And um, though I come away on a Wednesday, always ready to go back to work. Like mm -hmm. I remember why I'm, I'm sitting on the sidelines and not going, oh hell, I'll go work in an office. No, no, I can't. Um, and you know, yeah, that NEB meeting was 11 hours long and that was not before executive session. So, but can you watch countless people be passionate about each other, the organizations that support our ability to make these things happen. Um, I don't agree. We don't agree nicely. It's like a really bad dysfunctional Thanksgiving dinner. It's not as bad as it was my first union meeting. My first union meeting was right around the merger. 
and it dates me. Um, and I was with two other camera assistants who were, were all the same era. And I am watching He Who Shall Remain Nameless against another He Who Shall Remain Nameless. <laughs> or epic, just because I don't, you know, I don't want to say names in this case. Everybody in the local will know who they are and they would have no problem saying their names, but we don't know who's watching this in posterity and like to protect the not so innocent. Um, it was like watching them flamethrow back in not you know 1980 and i'm like you hold this crutch for like what and like, i was like when are the peas gonna go flying across the room who's throwing the mashed potato this is thanksgiving dinner with the extended family like and the alcohol has gone so you know that level of passion not there <laughs> thank god um we still disagree, but we've managed to do this in a much more civilized fashion. So, I mean, relative to where I came from. Um, and it's, there's still a lot of passion. There's still people who really care about how we're going to come back. They care about the craft. They care about the people in the craft. Um, and, you know, like I said to you when we were warming this up, I, I don't have a problem with the union, how, union and my money. Like, I might not agree with how they're spending it, but the process by which they make their decisions, I, you know what, every nickel's looked at. It's okay. It's okay. It's good. Um, so there, all of those meetings are just showing people are deeply committed to this and they really care and they're doing their best. I don't know how you get through this business without that. I just, and I don't, I've got other people in other businesses in my, my personal life. I don't know how they, they manage without that. How do they get up in the morning and face that stuff every day? Cause it's got to be grinding. We have our own grind, but it's not because we don't care. Yeah. And I, I, I definitely feel that that sense of community and like the, the connection between passion and generosity and effort, you know, that really, it does make the day, you know, like when you're on a set and someone who doesn't normally pick up something, you can tell it's a long day and they're like, can I push this cart for you? Can I carry this for you? That sense of like, you didn't have to do that, but you're like, yeah. actually, I'll, I'll take the help. <laughs> yeah. Those moments yeah. like, you know, you, you don't have to do that in other industries. And when you glimpse those, it just gives you hope. Like, that's why I keep doing this. That's why I want to keep going back to set. It it's like when loaders offer me water or tea, they're that's not their job, you know, or seconds do it, but it actually is what helps make my job happen. I might not be able to step away. And I mean, I will be next to a camera for hours at a clip um, without being able to step away. And that little, you know how I want my coffee? Oh God bless you. You know, that, yeah. Cause it, it, those little things make a difference. And I, I always did it and I, it ju I just did it. It didn't occur to me what the, what it was like on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing, it's like, no, no, I'm sorry. I can, I can manage a case for you. Like, I'm not that big. Let me push the cart. It's not a big deal. Um, if I've been handholding all day, no, I am not pushing the cart. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and that, that camaraderie, I think we may come out stronger after this. I think there's going to be a different kind of person who's going to survive on set. And anybody who's kind of in that competitive, you know, I can only do it as a gesture. I don't even know have words for it. Um, that kind of ego-driven, um, competitive type A will be channeled a different way. It, we're all competitive. We're all wanting to be top of our game, but I, I just think we're going to do it as a collective much better coming out of this. Well, you'd hope that it, it feels almost more sustainable that way, right? It's, it's, I think that's such a, dare I say, American instinct to be so individual. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, when you work 20 hours in the rain with someone, it really brings you together. <laughs> but I, I would hope that if we've all, if, you know, the lucky of us that have not uh, contracted COVID or have experienced COVID in our relatives or whatever, 
come back to work and say like, wow, it's like we just did a 20 hour date. It's like we just did three months in the rain together. Like you know, right. that brings you together to like right. be decent on set. Right. Um, I, I, I think, I think it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to, this is, you know, having gone through nine 11 and what that did and what that did to our business. Um, it was decimated for years. Yeah. Years. Um, I think we'll end up coming back way stronger. Um, if it doesn't kill you, it will make you stronger. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. This has been awesome. Um, it's been a pleasure. I love seeing you. Yeah. Like, I, I miss my friends. I miss, I know. I miss, you know, we do this because we love it. Yeah. And we love the people who do it. We're kind of a unique group of people. Well, I mean, that's something I was so grateful that you were interested in, in being a part of this because that was a huge shape, a huge part of my career is um, even just knowing that there was a women's committee at the local 600 and just showing up and, and seeing other people like that's such a, I mean, that's a whole other conversation about yeah. diversity and inclusivity, but you know, like that was such a major part of my own world to just see female camera operators, you know, like, right. Right. you know, you don't see, like, I, didn't have that when I was coming up, like yeah. I had never I, the first time I saw two female camera operators on set was when I did Jessica Jones with Kate LaRose. Wow. Yeah. That wasn't that I mean, long ago. <laughs> that was only a couple of years ago. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, uh, before me, the only cam female camera operator I had laid eyes on was Susan Stark. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're, I didn't have that image. So now seeing them and like, oh my God, wait a minute, we're on the same set. We're 50% of the population. Even if we're not 50% of a department, like that should have happened. So it is really great to see such a, we have an opportunity to bring a mix of people in now. We really have to do that. Yeah. The stories deserve it. Our narrative, the, the product we create deserve it. Well, normally I would say at the end of our calls is, do you have anything else to say to people at home? But you, I feel like you just said it. <laughs> like, this is the moment, you know? Like, yeah. it's almost exciting to think, like, why not take that on? You know, why yeah. not hire more women? Why not hire more BIPOC? Like, yeah, yeah. they're there. <laughs> and what, I mean, if you really want to serve the story that you're telling, we have to bring a panoply of life experience to it. We have to. It, every moment that you've lived informs the, the where you're choosing that frame. You know, where, what you're choosing to look at. And if we're not doing that, we're not working at the highest level of our craft, full stop. We're not. So when I start to, when I see shows that aren't diversified, I know the product, there's no way on God's green earth that product is what is, is as good as it could be. It's just not going to be. Well, as if the world doesn't already, like extra shout out to the crew of Pose and the cast yeah. of Pose, because that's something that's really special. And when there are more productions like that, they really do shine. Yeah, I think that was, you were on that the same day I was with Wilden. Uh, no, I never got the opportunity to work on those. Oh, I'm so wish. <laughs> I'm trying to think who it was. It all blurs, but that Are job coming was... back for season four? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that job, and this is a credit to Janet Mock and Jenny and Ryan Murphy and all of them. I walked on there and I felt like I could be me. Like, it didn't matter who I was, what, I could be purple with green hair, and, you know, whatever I was, I was of value as I was. And the feeling on that set was unlike anything I'd ever been a part of. And that is such a testimony to them, and the product shows it. So, you know, it, it, the performances show it, visuals show it all of it yeah 
Well, thank you so much again for all of what you do. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> we're trying to wrap it up. We keep going. I know. Pose, like, if anyone pose. hasn't seen it, watch Pose. <laughs> watch Pose. Watch Pose. It's amazing. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Have a great day. Yeah.